Amen. I hope that time of fellowship was sweet to you. It certainly looked great and sounded great from my perspective, and uh, thank you for participating. And I know for some of you that may be a stretch, you know, it's not the most comfortable thing to sort of feel like you're um, being forced to talk to people that it's like, well, I don't really, really like to talk to people that much, but... Um, it's hard to be a, a, a body of people if we don't talk to each other. So there has to come some point in which we step across that line and, and trust ourselves and trust the Lord to, uh, to bond us together in fellowship in that way. So thank you, thank you. Well, we are in week two of a series I've entitled God's Kingdom Economy, and last week, I looked at the subject of ownership, and I want to go back to that, just review a moment. Today, we're going to talk about about God's kingdom economy in relation to our attitude, or we might even use the word mindset, our attitude or mindset, how we we approach it. And last week, we looked at and we set this foundational principle that is so important, because if you miss this principle... Really, anything else that we talk about when it comes to God's understanding of money and possessions, it will fall short. As a matter of fact, it'll be on some pretty unstable ground. And it begins with this. God owns it all. You've got to start there. You've got to start with who is the owner of everything that we have. Everything in this room belongs to God. Every person in this room belongs to God. If he's the one that has created it, if he's the one we believe that he created us, then we belong to him. He owns us. Psalm 24, the Bible is just riddled with passages that we could take the whole next probably hour and just go through scripture after scripture after scripture that highlight this basic understanding, this basic principle that is so important for you to wrap your heart and your mind around and that is that God owns it all. In Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's. And that covers everything. This planet belongs to him. Everything about it. It says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. There it is, right there, plain as day. The world and all its people belong to him. Every person on this planet, everything on this planet belongs to our sovereign Father God. Everything is His. Deuteronomy 10, verse 14, it says, Look, the highest heavens and the earth and everything in it all belong to the Lord your God. There it is again. Everything, friend. Everything, say everything, everything Everything belongs to him. First Chronicles 29, verses 11 and 12. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone. Did you see that? Wealth and honor come from God alone. You rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand. And at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. We might summarize by saying this, God is in control of what he has made. God is in control. Now he gives tremendous liberty and freedom for us to have, make choices and and choices and decisions, but he, he has given us his Holy Spirit, he has given us his word so that we do that in alignment with him, in alignment with him. 
Not only, again, does he own everything, does he own the wealth, does he own our finance, does he own the possessions, does he own everything on the earth, he also owns us, does he not? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and who was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. You don't even own you. But God owns us. Amen? We are not our own. For God bought us, bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. So he owns it all. And he so wanted to continue to be the owner of it that he, that he shed his own blood, his son's own blood, in order to keep what he had created, you and me. Amen? We have to start with this basic principle because as soon as we begin to buy into a mindset that God doesn't own anything or God doesn't own this part of my life, then we begin to take possession and begin to exercise our own control and that's when things run amok. No matter what it is in our life, we're talking about our possessions. We're talking about finances. We could apply that to really any aspect of our life. God wants to be the owner of your life. And he is a good father. You know, we sing that song, he is a good, good father. You know, the Bible Bible says that if if you ask for bread, he he won't give you a stone. He's not going to give you a snake. Our our good, good father knows exactly what you and I need. And he wants to provide for you. Do you know that? We often view God as this angry person that's detached from us, that somehow wants us to suffer as much as we can just barely endure and get by. But that is not who your father is is described as in this good book. He is a good, good father. Now, that doesn't mean that he's going to spoil you rotten either. That doesn't mean that he won't at times withhold from you because he knows what is best, even though it's what you might want. But he is a good father. He will take care of you. He will provide for you. So if God is the owner, what does that make you and me? Well, we won't take time to to dig too deep into this, but it's an important concept that I think we need to lay out here because it's important to understand the relationship. Because if God is the owner, what does that make us? The Bible calls that a steward. Another, The English word might be a manager. In other words, God has everything and he has assigned you and me to be managers of it, to be caretakers of it, whether it's caretakers of the earth, caretakers of possessions, caretakers of relationship. But we are to be caretakers of what is rightfully his. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 7, verse 17 through 19, Paul makes this instruction. He says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. How many can say amen to that? Money is unreliable. (laughs) You might have it today, but it may be gone tomorrow, right? You know, stewardship is never about how much money you have. Stewardship is all about what you do have what God has actually put into your hands and made you responsible for. Their trust, uh, Paul goes on, their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. There it is, to be a good steward. Paul is instructing, tell those who have wealth, who have means, who have financial possessions to use that for good amen that is what a good steward does uses wealth uses finances 
for good. Now, providing for your family, that's good. Can you say amen? amen. Providing for your family is good. You know, providing for an education, that's good. Uh, investing in ministry, that's good. Investing in missions, that's good. That's good. He says they should, they should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. Wow. What if every believer on the planet handled our finances in, with that kind of attitude? Always looking to do good. Always looking for an opportunity to bless to give, to encourage. Well, we know that we're constantly bombarded with pressure, right, in this world. How many of you feel, how many of you have felt, let's just start there, have felt under financial pressure? How many have ever felt that? Right. We know what that feels like. You feel like there's more month at the end of the money, right? It's just not enough there. You just feel like you can't make it. You just, you know, you're not, you're unsure how this is all going to work out. We've all felt that pressure. And it's easy for us to then begin to uh, forget about being in alignment with God's Word and begin to take things into our own control, Right? You ever been tempted to do that? Maybe. All right, one person admitted it. The rest of you, you'll get there. Look, it's not easy. It's not easy living this life. When you became a believer, there was no promise that you were going to have an easier life but what the promise did say is that you're going to have a more fulfilling life. You'll have a more joyful life. You'll have an eternal life. But never promises that it's going to be easy. We don't know what situation is awaiting us around the next turn. But it's important that we not lose sight of how God wants us to think about things. And we turn to his word and try to learn about what he has to say about faith and about prayer and about all kinds of things. But as I said last week, he says more about how we deal with money than most any other subject in the Bible. Maybe the kingdom of God, the topic of his kingdom, might be more prevalent than he says about money. And have you ever wondered why? I think we all know the answer to that, right? Because it is the one area that we all have in common that we probably struggle with the most in our life. Always wondering if we have enough. Always wondering if we're making wise decisions. And so God gave us a lot to learn from, a lot to think about. So today I want to talk to you about attitude. Because I think the way in which we approach our finances is just as important as the finances that we actually have. And this is a message that I have shared in the past. And it was inspired by Pastor um, John Maxwell, who I heard give these principles probably three decades ago. And they have been impactful for me. And I wanted to impart them to you today. Because I think these principles will help you to get the right mindset around this issue of how you handle and how you think about and how you approach your possessions. So, how do we have this kingdom mindset? I want you to turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. We're going to look at the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. And learn some principles of how we often approach how we shouldn't approach, and how we should approach 
our finances. <clears throat> Luke chapter 10, verse 25. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? It's a pretty good question, right? But you would think that a man who is a religious student, a religious scribe, a religious lawyer, would know the answer to that. He wasn't really interested in the answer. What he was trying to do was to trick Jesus. It says, Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? And the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. And the man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now think about this. How many times have you and I had this same conversation with God? Maybe not this exact topic, but we've approached God. We already knew the answer to our question, but we're trying to get him to say it differently. We're trying to get him, you know, you keep, sometimes people ask the same question over and over, trying to get a different answer. That's a little bit what this guy was doing. Religious-minded people continue to debate what God's Word makes clear. We're often guilty of asking God the same question over and over and over and over and over and over, expecting to get a different answer, especially when it comes to our finances. His economic system is not complicated. He's the owner. I'm the steward. My responsibility is to trust and obey what he says. It's not a difficult system at all. But we are tempted to keep asking him to change the rules of his system so that we can be in control of everything and let him know what we're going to do and then expect him to bail us out when our plan doesn't work out. Isn't that how it often happens? However, this religious man's question does provide us with some perspective about how we view and use the resources God has so graciously extended to us. And here are three attitudes, or we might say mindsets, regarding possessions. And here's the first one. What's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. That's a mindset. What's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. In Luke chapter 10, verse 30, then, we continue with this story. Jesus said, replied with this story to the man's question. He said, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead by beside the road. That wasn't very nice, was it? Wasn't nice at all. The bandits or the robbers saw an opportunity to take what was not rightfully theirs. In this case, they took it by force. They beat the victim into submission and cast him aside, threw him in a ditch for dead. This mindset or attitude is pervasive in our world today. In America, we have this thing called smash and grab. Have you seen videos of this? It's absolute lunacy. You know, thieves will go through a mall, for example. They'll walk into a mall. A group of people bust into a, uh, a, a jewelry department, bust the glass, grab it, and take off running. Unreal. And most companies now have a policy that you do not stop a thief. I don't, I don't know how well I would do in that situation. To be honest, <laughs> I would probably be the person that would be shot. Uh, yep, he grabbed him by the ankle and they shot him. But I just don't know. I could stand by and watch that happen. But this is happening all over, all over the place. What, what is going on? This is part of this mindset that we have in our culture today that if you have something and I want it, I just, I'm, I'm just going to take it. I'm just going to take it. <clears throat> now, I don't think we have any bandits here this morning, do we? We don't, no. We, we may not be bandits in that kind of way, but, uh, you know, it is tax season. I'm not looking up at all. <laughs> mm-mm, mm-mm. Well, nobody's going to miss that, you know. I mean, I work for it. It's mine, right? And so we fudge a little bit. Or what about the office supply room? Uh, they won't miss anything from there. I mean, I need a 
few notepads at home and some pens. I mean, I'm kind of running low this week, and nobody's going to miss that, right? Uh, or the credit card, well, you know, the company credit card, well, you know, I mean, they have plenty of money. Ain't nobody going to miss a little bit that I use this for personal use. What about our time card? You know, it's not exactly a possession, but it really is because it involves, you know, well, um, they were going to pay me anyways. I mean, even though I didn't, I only put in 25 hours, but, you know, they were going to pay me for 40. I mean, they've already budgeted, so they might, might as well just, see, that is a mindset of what's yours is mine, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it from you. And, and we make these little um, excuses in our, in our head and of how we treat things, but you know, there's only one problem with that. The owner sees it all. Father, Father is watching all of this. He's watching. And He watches how we even handle the little things. The Bible is clear. He who is, who is faithful with little will be given much. And sometimes we wonder, why? You know, why am I struggling here? Why, 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 why does it seem like there's a lack of? And, and it may be that your Father is just simply responding to your unwillingness to be faithful and to be honorable with the little that you do have. And so if we're constantly taking what is not rightfully ours, we're just assuming that, well, nobody's watching, nobody's looking, I can take that. In Malachi chapter 3, you don't have to turn there, I just want to read this uh, to you. <clears throat> but it says, will a man rob God? And the question comes back, yet you have robbed me, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, says the Lord. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that they may, there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If, it, <clears throat> if I will not open, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up, for you, the windows of heaven, and pour out such a blessing that there will not be enough room to receive it. Now, the context of this chapter, sometimes it's taking out of context, and I think it's important to have it in context. This was an admonishment to the leaders of Israel because, uh, and the people of Israel because God's requirement at this time was for them to bring the first fruits of what they possessed. In this case, it was their lambs. They were to make an animal sacrifice, and they were to bring an unblemished lamb, and it was to bring their best to the Lord. And if you read in the first couple of chapters of Malachi, it's clear that Israel was totally in disobedience to this. They were bringing the lame lambs. They were bringing the broken. They were bringing what was left. They were bringing God the leftovers of what they had. And they were keeping the best for themselves. And the Lord's admonishment to them was that, why are you robbing me? Robbing you? I mean, that's strong. So think about this. That this point isn't to try and guilt you into tithing at all. The, the point is much bigger than that, all right? It's this. How can you rob someone unless they already own it? Right? You can't rob someone that doesn't own anything. I mean, to, to rob them is to take away from them what is rightfully theirs. And here's the deal. God was saying to Israel, all of that belongs to me. All of that belongs to me. So why are you robbing me of what I ask you to bring? Why are you robbing me? And so the attitude we should have before the Lord when it comes to 
what is rightfully His already is that we want to bring our best to Him. We want to bring our best offerings to the Lord. Amen? Amen? Not just what is left over. And when you begin to realize, when you, when you adopt this mindset that God already possesses ownership of everything, it changes the way that then you let go of it. It changes the way you let go of it. Because when you think, I worked for this, I did this, I punched the time card, I did the work, I'm the one that sweated, I'm holding on to this. At that moment, you just lost it. You just, you just limited that. What God wants you to do is to live open-handed in this tight-fisted world. The world is teaching you this. Get what you can, hold on to it, and don't let anybody else get it. And God's economy is so much greater. His economy is keep your hand open. I'll provide for you. I'll give you the strength to go to work. I'll open up that door for you to get that job. I'll see that, you know, that car doesn't break down in the next six months. He will provide for you, and we're going to get into some of that next week, and it really gets exciting. And so, when, when we have this understanding, then we are certainly careful that we're not taking from God, but we're offering ourselves freely to Him. Amen? Does that make sense? What's mine is mine is the second one. What's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. So the first mindset is this, a wrongful mindset, is what's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. And this one is what's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. Verse 31, by chance, a priest came along. So this man is laying, over, he's been robbed, he's laying in a ditch. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed by him. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed on the other side. This attitude of what's mine is mine and I'm going to keep it is reflected in the priest and the Levite. They weren't interested in robbing the man or taking advantage of his crisis situation. They were more concerned about keeping or holding on to what they possessed. The priest and the Levite might represent the attitude of Christians who are unwilling to release God's possessions to help others. If our attitude is to hold on to what we have, then it's only a matter of time before we end up losing it anyway. Jesus said the things in this life will rust and mold, and therefore he cautions us from storing up possessions here and encourages us to store up possessions for eternity. What are you investing in? I think it's important that you have investments so that your money is working for you, certainly. But in terms of eternity, what are you investing in? You see, there's only one thing that's going out of this world that we could honestly say that we, that we had impact and it's going with us outside of our, our own soul. And that is the souls of those that we were able to help fund ministry and missions that they too could spend eternity with the Father. Amen? Well, let's end with this mindset. It's the right one. What's mine is yours, and I'm going to give it. Luke 10, verse 33. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. And then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. And the next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. 
If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. And the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. And then Jesus said, yes, go now and do the same. Friend, this is the proper attitude of a steward who puts to practice the resources he or she has been given by God. There is liberty when you decide to live open-handed again in this tight, tight-fisted world. When it comes to your mindset about your money, you can have a mindset of being a taker, a keeper, or a giver. This Bible, this good book, is full of instruction to always be a giver. Amen? To manage well, to invest well, to make wise decisions, to seek the Lord in those decisions so that you can become a blessing to those that need to be blessed. Friend, when you begin to get your heart set around this mindset of, what's, of what is yours, what God has put in your possession, what, what He has given you, what He has enabled you to, acqu- to accumulate so that you can be a blessing to other people, it will change the way you even walk out of this room today and interact with the world around you. You will actually be looking for opportunities to be a blessing rather than looking for danger that's somehow going to take from you what you possess. What you possess. When you live in this way, there's freedom. There is absolute freedom. And it's unexplainable. And it's not about you getting a bigger house or a bigger car or anything like that. It's not about that. You just begin to live in a peace that surpasses what this world can offer. Amen? And many of you, you have been living this way most of your life, most of your Christian life. And I want to thank you. Others of you, you're like, wow, okay. I hear that, Pastor. Worship team, come on up. I hear that, Pastor. But you haven't seen my bills lately. No, I haven't. But God sees them. God sees them. What I want to encourage you to do is this. Begin to make Him the first focus of everything that you own. And I'm telling you, Everything will change. Everything. We'll talk more about it next week. Let's stand to our feet.